Anu, let's move to the hot topic of funding and source of funds. Uh, and since you are, you know, you represent a lot of investors. So one question I, I always get asked is, do we have to fund at the beginning or do we fund after we get the green card or somewhere in the middle? And before someone can fund, what is required, um, you know, from a USCI standpoint? So I'm going to start with my standpoint first, which is <laughs> please don't transfer money until you've retained an attorney and until the attorney has reviewed your documentation. We tend to find about maybe a third of investors who come to retain us have been transferring funds for either over the course of the last three years or over the last three weeks have already transferred the funds because in their mind, they kickstarted the process on their own and maybe we will charge a little less because they've already completed part of the process. Unfortunately, that's kind of not how it works. Um, so, so I'll answer your second question first and then go back to the first question. So the second question of what sort of documentation is required the government is expecting to see that you're able to trace your funds to a lawful source. And that basically means it's not sufficient to just show a bank statement and a tax return to say, I've made X amounts of dollars or rupees over the last year or two, and here's one bank statement to show the wire transfer to the regional center. If your money is coming from a sale of property, depending on when the property was purchased, you'd have to show how you had the money to purchase the property. If you built or developed the property, how you had the money to do that. If you sold the property, you know your sales contract, the money coming into your bank account and then being retained in the bank account until you've transferred the funds to the regional center. So basically having to show that pathway to that original source, which is how you had the money to, to initially purchase that property. So, if you started the process a few years ago, it may be a little bit more difficult to trace because I'm sure there wasn't an expectation that you're going to have to provide the documents for EB-5. So that's why I always prefer clients not transfer the money until you've hired a client because we have to really document that source of funds. And there have been some additional nuances because of the RIA that was passed last year and you know the, the biggest ones for clients is going to be if they have a private lender being able to document the source of funds there. I'm a firm believer in not providing the government too much documentation because I feel like then we're just going to move the bar higher and higher. If the government is used to seeing the documents from everyone, even if it's not required by regulation or law, they're going to expect that and we're going to see requests for evidence. So what I do in our practice is show me that we have it in the event there's a request for evidence, we can provide the documents. But at the outset, I want to provide what I am 99% certain will go through without a request for evidence, but I don't want to go overboard and provide too much documentation. And at the outset and during consultations, your attorney will kind of go through with you the level of documentation that's expected. And you need to make sure that you're comfortable with that. The people who are involved in your process are comfortable with that. Um, so any gift or any private lender is comfortable opening up kind of their documents and books to you as well. Now to go to your first question, because I'm sure my colleagues will cover a little bit more on the source of funds, is the investment. Um, you can be fully invested or in the process of investing at the time you file your 526E petition. I would say prior to 2019, my preference was to be fully invested prior to filing, just because I can then review the full source of funds I know the strength of the case at the time of filing. 2019 is when we saw the increase in the investment amount and investors simply didn't have the ability to kind of come up with that extra money within a short period of time. And they wanted to file before the investment amount went up to 800,000. So in 2019, we saw a lot of partial investments where they invested a portion of them funds and then had a contract with the regional center confirming that they would invest the remainder of the funds 
within a certain period of time, usually three, six, eight months from the first investment. And you want to make sure that you have a good idea of what the source of funds is at the time of the filing, because you should be able to at least identify what that's going to be at the initial stage. My preference is still going to be full investment because we know at the time what it is, we can document it, and I know the strength of the case. So the only risk is if you do a partial investment and you haven't documented your source of funds, that you are running the risk where if you aren't able to, to source the funds, that we are stuck with that. Um, slightly risky, I don't say, I still do it. We still do partial investments and it's been perfectly fine. Thanks, Anu. Um, Nima, your thoughts on you know partial funding, that again is one of the hot topics. We get a lot of questions about it. So I would love to know your thoughts, not only from a standpoint of whether you're okay with it or not, but also how, how much should the investor, if you're okay with it, should be the first investment? How much should it be? Should it be negligible? 100K, 200K, 250K, and how long can they take to uh, complete the entire investment? Yeah, if I have any recognition in the industry, it would probably be for this. Um, you know, these partial investments are something that we started doing in, in 2016. So to be clear, it's not the RIA that passed in 2022 that allows partial investment. Mm -hmm. The original EB-5 rules very clearly stated that you do not need to be fully invested until you file EA-29. What ended up happening as USCIS was processing these cases is they did approve many EB-5s that were not fully invested. And at the A29, um, you would need to show evidence that you were fully invested or you would get an RFE from USCIS asking for full investment. As we move forward in time, USCIS as an adjudicative trend started issuing RFEs and notices of intent to deny when they went to adjudicate the EB-5, the I-526. And so adjudicatively, USCIS decided if you're not fully invested by the time we're ready to approve your EB-5, you're not going to be approved. What the RIA did was change that from a trend to actual law. And what the RIA says is you do not need to be fully invested in order to file the EB-5, but you do need to be fully invested to be approved and in order to file what we would call one of these partial investments, you need to prove two things. One is your intent to fund. And then the second is your ability to fund. So I think intent to fund would be covered by the investment contracts that you're signing. Certainly any regional center you move forward with is also going to provide an additional, let's call it a partial capital commitment letter that's going to detail what your initial investment is, what your runway is to, to make the balance of the investment, maybe what the source of funds are. And there may be a penalty if you don't move forward uh, with the balance of the investment to make it a, a valid contract. Uh, the second, and this is what Andrew explained really well, is you need to show an ability to fund. So for example, for someone that has a securities or a stock portfolio and is looking for the right time to liquidate, maybe they rather move forward as a partial investment, give themselves three to six months to see if the market turns up or down, and then at that time liquidate. And from a source of funds perspective, we would show to USCIS how the income was earned to fund the brokerage account, and then all the current assets within the brokerage account and what their value is. So then USCIS can say, oh, well, okay, well, this individual has a million uh, in their brokerage account. Once they do liquidate it, it is reasonable that they can fund the balance. If you were to do a HELOC, for example, um, or any other cash out refinance on, on your property, you know, we would show the, the income documents of how you bought the home the deed that you own the home, some sort of online appraisal that shows that there is value. These are the things that we would evidence uh, to show the ability to fund. In terms of, is there a magic number that says what the initial investment is? No. Um, I think that comes down to a little bit of the preference of the project that you are moving forward with. Um, some regional centers may say, well, we need 500 and we'll give you runway. Some regional centers may say, we'll take 50 and then we'll give you six months. The important thing to note, um, it is not USCIS rule on how long you have to make the balance of the investment. We are playing the game of how long will it take for USCIS to review your application. So if we're targeting some sort of 12, 14 months for rural, maybe 18 to 24 months uh, for, for high unemployment, 
you know, maybe you have eight months uh, to, you know, 15 months before USCIS is reviewing your case. So a regional center may say, hey, we'll give you a year and a half. Uh, but that number is pretty immaterial if you get an RFE in, in month eight that says, where's the money? Um, so I think you'll see most projects that are willing to work with you. Um, you're going to see a shorter duration. I would say one year is the max, but I think a lot of, a lot are going to be comfortable with maybe the six month mark. Um, and of course, we have a limited window to do this because if USCIS does get this fee study out, they do increase the filing fees. They are able to get processing down to six months or less. Um, you're not going to have the ability to do partial funding. Um, of course, as I said, we've been doing this since 2016. We've we've filed and, and secured approval for investors that made a zero investment um, and then later did the balance. But I think in general, in, in good practice, an investor having the ability to fund, but waiting for more favorable market conditions, whether it's interest rates, the S&P or the Dow or, or you know, whatever the currency exchange is, the Forex trade, um, is a much better situation than an investor that is hoping and praying something comes along in the near future. Uh, whether that's a gift from a friend or a family member um, or whatever it may be that they're, that they're planning on, the hope is a little worrisome. Um, because then, of course, if, if you're not able to make the investment, you've lost a lot of, a lot of money. Um, in legal fees, government filing fees, maybe whatever fee the regional center charged you. But more importantly, especially to a Chinese or an Indian national, you've lost time. Um, you know, if you weren't able to move forward and it takes you another year to collect the cash, your priority date is going to be significantly later. Um, so absolutely okay with partial investment. Uh, but as Anu said, I'd like to know that you know where the money is coming from. And the reason that you're not doing the full 800000 is waiting for more favorable market conditions. Thanks, Nima. Um, Rohit, coming to you now, um, your thoughts on partial investment. And again, also, what if someone cannot complete the investment? What's the consequence from, a, from an immigration standpoint and also from a financial standpoint? So, you know, I, I was not a trailblazer like Nima. Um, on, on the partial. And I've always been, um, you know, had some level of concern with it. Do I do it? Yes. Um, and is it obviously increasing in frequency? Absolutely. Uh, there is a need for investors for all of the reasons he mentioned, you know, market conditions, they'd rather keep their money in savings account, earn a bunch more interest right now, because that's available. Um, or they just, they have remittance restrictions for whatever reason, and they're not able to get the full capital out. Um, or they're trying to sell a piece of asset and, um, you know, market's not allowing for it. Uh, but as he indicated, you know, I want to know the full story. I, I don't want a surprise down the line um, where and I'd like to go out with the full sort of perspective to USCIS. Here's the story. Here's the first part of the investment that's coming in. And the balance is going to come from X, Y, Z. Um, now, I always build in a little bit more flexibility when I'm presenting it and say, if it's not coming from XYZ, potentially it's going to come from ABC. Uh, that way, it's A, not a surprise to USCIS, B, not a surprise to me. What we don't want to be in a position is we spent you know, 70 hours structuring and going through source of funds for the first amount. And then the client comes back to us a year later and you know now we have to spend another 80 hours going through this brand new source of funds. It's going to be very expensive for the investor. It's going to be very time consuming and it could result in surprises none of us want. Uh, but is it something that's permissible? Absolutely. Is it something that an investor who cannot get their full capital out should consider if they want to get a priority date? Absolutely. Um, we just have to be careful about how we go about it. So I think that was your first question. What was your second question? That was and uh, one of the- Oh, the, the legal implications if they yeah. can't fund. Um, you know, that's going to depend on what agreement they sign with the EB-5 entity, right? So they're going to sign a side letter with the EB-5 entity. It's going to stipulate, this is our plan. We are going to fund in one installment, two installments, whatever it is, and we are going to find, fund within some period. Now, in most cases, at least when I'm structuring the deal, um, I will put language in the partnership agreement or in the operating agreement that talks about what happens if someone doesn't fully fund. So if the person funded $400,000 and they want out, more than likely the capital has been spent, more than likely the capital is already in, 
And we will have language in there that talks about what it means for them on the long-term basis. It's not exactly that they're going to have a redemption ability right off the back and say, you know what, we changed our mind, circumstances change, we want our capital back. The capital is already sunk into the project, so there's no clawback provision in those type of instances. So the investor has to go in eyes wide open, understand what they're signing um, with the fund, and you know understand that there is no side letter. We have to be very careful from the fund perspective. Investors are all treated the same. So it's not that one person is more favorable deal than the other. Um, I think many times I've noticed that investors don't fully understand that. They feel that, oh, well, you know, th circumstances change. The fund is taking advantage of me because they're not giving me my money back right away. Well, that's not the case. The, the reality is the fund has to be very careful what they're doing with each investor, because if they treat one more preferably than the other, then they're exposing themselves to liability. So it's you know, cost benefit analysis. I guess there's also this issue of immigration or on the immigration side that if you're guaranteed that you'll get your money back in case uh, you are yeah. unable to fund the full amount, that means part or whole of your funds are being guaranteed to you, which is not allowed under EB-5, right. which can lead to a denial. So I think it's not out of malice, but also safeguarding uh, the immigration of the investors uh, in not returning the funds or guaranteeing the return of funds right away. So I guess the worst case scenario in that case from a financial standpoint is that they're locked in for the five or seven year loan term and then you get your partial funding back. It's not that you've lost the money. It's just no, that it's correct, locked correct. in, right? So Correct. correct. I, uh, can, I, can I conclusively say that that's going to be the situation with every fund? No, right? So you, you read carefully what you're signing up for, understand right. what the implications are. Um, now, if you feel that... So... You know, a, a way to look at this, there's a there's a concept called accredited investor concept, right? And the accredited investor concept from a securities perspective is looking to see whether or not you have the capital, the knowledge and the sophistication level to actually make such an investment. What we tell investors, if this is capital that you're heavily relying on, you have then don't do EB-5. It's a lot of money. There is a potential for gain. There's a potential for loss. That's uh, for loss. That's what the law stipulates. And if things go wrong and you are heavily relying on this payback, I mean, we all want to get money back. Lots of funds out there will repay economic conditions, notwithstanding, you will get your capital and your principal back within five, seven years or whatever the structure is. But if by, you know, some unfortunate instance, you lose it, then you have to be able to withstand what that looks like. And so any financial manager or investment analyst will tell you, don't put all your eggs in that one basket um, and rely on that because, you know, you could get disappointed. I'm glad you touched on the accredited investor uh, term because that was going to be one of my questions later, but it, it'll be great if you can address it now. What is an accredited investor? So in a nutshell, it's it's uh, it's an old definition. It's been under uh, the, the Securities Exchange Act for, for many, many years. Um, but the simple explanation is an individual who individually makes $200,000 or if married uh, cumulatively with the spouse makes $300,000 and has done so for the last two years with an expectation they're going to continue to do so in the current year and possibly in the future. Or it is also um, a person who has access to a million dollars worth uh, um, of net worth. And that million dollars of net worth does not include the value of their home. So just targeting individuals that have that capital to make an investment without actually, um, and, and you know, not necessarily you're going to fill that huge pinch if they lose it. That's number one. The reason this is around is from a private perspective, uh, when the fund is making an investment, when you're actually offering, because it's a private equity, it's not a publicly traded company, all investors that invest must be deemed accredited because they're coming in, they're looking at the documents. It's not as if they're buying a share for a publicly traded company, which anyone can do, right? You open up a Fidelity or a Robinhood account and you can actually buy a share. Here, you're buying uh, an ownership interest, membership interest, limited partnership interest. And so you need to really understand 
that the 1,000 pages worth of documents or more that you're getting from the fund, what exactly is in there? Um, and it's not just you, a financial advisor and a lawyer who's going to teach you that, um, but you really need to be able to withstand what that is. That's what an accredited investor is. Got it. Thanks for that, Roy. Neema, coming to you, we get uh, this question a lot that can I fund my EB-5 investment with a 401k or a loan against 401k or IRA contributions? So could you shed some light on that, please? Um, can I just say yes and then stop talking or do I have to? Uh, so I think this, this comes up a lot. There was just Q&A questions about it that I was answering. Um, so I'm going to be very general here because this is very fact specific to your 401k. Um, so if you cash out a 401k, you have heavy tax implications. Uh, so most investors do not want to cash out the 401k. They do not want to take on that tax burden. Uh, that leaves you with a couple options. One is borrowing against your 401k. So going to a lender, putting your 401k as, as collateral for a loan, um, and then using those loan proceeds to invest in EB-5. Typical loan to value on a 401k loan is about 50%. Uh, so depending on how much money you need from your 401k, the 50% may not be sufficient. Um, Self-directed IRAs, as long as the EB-5 investment does not violate the rules of the or the of the self-directed program, um, can be used for EB-5 investment. Self-directed IRA is, is a RIA in your own name where you have the ability to make any investment that is not in your, your primary residence. And then comes up the idea of a rollover 401k. Uh, so if you have a 401k balance from a previous employer, uh, that in general typically uh, can be rolled over to a self-directed IRA and then from there uh, invested in EB-5. Thanks for that. Um, I'll continue on to this source of funds topics because, I mean, there are different sources. It could be gift, it could be a loan, unsecured loan, etc. Another common way of funding investment uh, happens to be loan against property or a home equity line of credit. Uh, do things differ if the loan is in the United States versus, uh, you know, outside of the United States? Rohit? If you're taking it collateralized or uncollateralized, which one? Collateralized. <laughs> well, it's a topic that's near and dear to your heart um, for Indian collateral, right? So um, you, you would need to figure out what the ramifications are and what the permissibility is in your current country um, of origin, particularly where the asset class is, and determine whether or not you would be permitted to take a loan against such property. Um, you know, there are some countries, India being a primary example, where there's a concern that if you're taking a loan from a finance, banking financial institution and your collateral is a piece of real uh, estate asset there, that that could end up being a deadbeat right asset. And there, that capital flight as a result of taking the, the, um, the principal out of the country would be uh, end up being you know, a red on the books. And so in those instances, there are requirements or rather regulations that would prohibit such an action. In some other countries, this step of rule does not exist. What I tell clients um, off the back is, you know, A, make sure you're conformity with your, with your regulations. Because if you violate the laws of your country, USCIS would look at it and say, well, you are potentially going to violate the rules of the United States. And so they would deem that ineligible. Number two, look at whether or not we can source that collateral. So this is a very interesting element where I get this a lot where investors says, oh, my source of funds is easy. I have this piece of asset. You know, I bought it in 2018. It, I bought it for 500000 and now it's worth $2 million. I'm just going to take a loan against it and voila, we've got it. Great. I'm happy you're going to get a loan against it. I don't need to source the bank money. Perfect. But how did you buy that piece of property and how did you service your um, your interest payments if you took a mortgage? And that's where things get really wonky because they may not be able to source their down payment. They not, may not be able to source all of their mortgage payments that made over a period. So it, it is something we have to be very careful about. Um, and it's something that I've seen time and time and again, it's becoming more popular. Uh, and it was, uh, at least for the South Asian market, it was immensely popular for the Chinese market for many years. And, um, you know, it could work, but again, just be very careful. Uh, that's one. And the other element that I'd be very cognizant of as well is who is the owner of the property? Who's going to be the actual debtor on that piece of property? 
you need to be careful that if you the investor is different um, from the actual owner of the collateral and the loan proceeds are being gifted, is that permissible under the loan contract that they've taken with the actual lender? So lots of different elements that you have to consider before you simply just walk down that path. Thanks, Roy. Um, last question to Nima before we open up the floor for questions. Are unsecured loans and gifts okay for funding EB-5 investment and uh, what to keep in mind when you're opting for that option? Um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, word of mouth from an attorney that you need to you need to accept or from a regional center. This comes specifically from a lawsuit against USCIS called Zang versus USCIS. Uh, I think started in 2018 and then decided in 2019 or started in 2017 and settled in 2018. And essentially what it said is, USCIS is not an uh, underwriter. Uh, it is not their purview to step in the shoes of a lender and then decide why a lender has decided to issue a loan. If a lender is willing to, to issue an unsecured loan um, or a secured loan, that is not the business of USCIS. Absent fraud, USCIS is only there to verify the documents that they come from a lawful source. Um, as Rohit said, if you are going to a bank, um, to secure a loan, either secured or unsecured, um, then there is no question of source of funds. Uh, you would just provide the bank loan and then the capitalized bank statement evidencing you received those loan proceeds and then the wire to the project. If you are going to any entity that is not a bank, friend, family member, a company that you may have a relationship with, those entities are required to prove source of funds. So if they're issuing you, say, for example, you have a very dear family member or a dear friend or colleague that is willing to give you 800,000 plus or less, whatever the dollar amount is, they can absolutely enter into a gift or a secured or unsecured loan agreement with you, but they need to provide income documents evidencing how they earn the money. Now, for someone that's in the United States working at a very successful job with a high W-2, maybe the documentation is quite easy. Tax returns, W-2s, bank statements, for the period of time that it took them to earn the loan amount, um, you know, plus the loan or gift agreement, and we're good to go. If it's somebody outside the United States, maybe they deal with a cash business, um, that's when you get into these hurdles of, of source of funds. Um, and that's really where, in the filing of your EB-5, that's where we as attorneys spend the most time. I think it's really common for investors to tell us, my source of funds is really easy, it's all US income, uh, but what they leave out is that their parents, being great parents, have been sending them a few thousand a month from India for five years. Um, or they were a student in the United States and their parents in China sent them, you know, 100,000 while we were there. And that, that 100,000 is still in their bank account and being is used for the EB-5. So any source actually works. Gift, loan, secured, unsecured, you can sell gold, you can sell a vase, you can sell a painting, you can sell a watch. Anything that is legally transacted can work, but it really comes down to what documentation you can provide. Uh, certainly for our Chinese national and Vietnamese national investors, we actually prefer property sale because it's oftentimes that they have owned a property for 20 years and they may have bought it for as low as eight to 10,000 and it is now worth 1 million plus. Now they may not have documents from 20 years ago on how they purchased the home for 10,000, but it is a relatively small number when it's either the sale or the loan transaction um, that is accounting for the 800,000 investment. Um, so those applications tend to be easier. Uh, but for as Rohit said, if you purchased a home for 500,000, it's a pretty significant number. Uh, USCIS is going to want documentation for that. Uh, a related question as a follow-up. Um, does the burden of proof increase with uh, if the age of the property is less versus, you know, if it's an old property or an inherited property? I think, you know, USCIS doesn't really have a sense of time. Uh, they seem to follow this idea of seed to tree. So yeah. whenever that first dollar was made um, to to the, the disposition or sale of that asset, now we want everything. Of course, in the real world, um, time matters. Uh, by law, most banks, accountants, attorneys are only required to keep documents for seven years. So if we're talking about a property that's 20 or so years old, um, it's very unlikely you have that documentation. 
in many countries, you can't even get that documentation, right? Uh, just the history, uh, the notational history does not go back that far. So what we rely on heavily is present documents. Um, and then of course, a narrative to establish who you are. I think it's it's often a mistake by attorneys that they just send documents without a narrative establishing who this person is, who their family is, who their history is. Uh, because the standard for approval is 51%, not 100. Um, that doesn't mean that 51% of the 800,000, so what is, how's my math, 410,000 can, right. be, can be undocumented and then the balance is documented. That's not what it means. It means that after reviewing your documents, an adjudicator at USCIS feels more likely than not that this is all truthful. Um, so when documents are not available, providing secondary documents, whether it's affidavits for friends or family members, newspaper articles, photos, uh, maybe letters of recognition or awards, these are the things that we want to bundle in um, to develop a pattern of who you have been as a human being, along with providing you know, 100% of the documentation for any transaction that took in the last seven years, that gives credibility to your application. Great. Thank you. And I know you took the trouble of answering so many questions, but I will ask Rohit those questions as well so that the larger audience can also hear the answers. Uh, but uh, I have a few here uh, to begin with. Uh, can someone fund their investment if all the funds have been earned in the United States or do they have to bring them from outside the U.S.? Rohit? Absolutely. They can fund it with U.S. earnings. They can fund it with foreign earnings um, or foreign gifts. Uh, I would be very cognizant of any tax implications that might occur. Um, if to the extent they're U.S. earnings and they and they're, the funds are being gifted over, be cognizant of the gift tax implications. Um, if they are foreign earnings, but they're stemming out of a U.S. bank account and then being gifted over to you, again, be cognizant of the gift tax earnings. So, you know, what, what I end up doing many times when we're looking at a lot of these cases, um, one of the benefits of a big law firm is you get, uh, you know, in-house tax counsel. And so if there's ever a question on, on, a, on a taxable issue, I will just simply you know, walk next door and ask the question and, and see what, what can and cannot be done. But you know, the, the question is, uh, and I'm usually asked this, is can we only, are we restricted to the funds being only ones that we brought in from India or elsewhere, um, or can we use what we've earned in the US? Absolutely, you're here on H-1B, you've actually used the funds, um, no problem. You can, you can certainly rely on them. Great. Um, so next... if you don't mind, I hate I hate this tax thing. Um, it's a, it's another short rant, but I think this is really stupid. I'm a lawyer in the United States. I have not yet paid taxes on my 2022 income. I have not yet paid taxes on my 2023 income. Does that mean that the money I earned is now unlawful? No, my money is still lawful, right? Here's my bank statements. Here's my business. Here's my operating agreement, all that stuff. Now, if USCIS were to issue a tax return for me, or sorry, issue an RFE asking for my taxes, I could write back, I haven't filed it. And it's none of your business whether or not I filed it, right? Could they actually hold up my application for that? No, because there's nothing that says my money was lawfully, not lawfully earned, right? Taxes are something that I do after, right? I mean, in fact, in the United States, you can carry losses for five years. And you, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of that, that goes into taxes, not to derail the program, but I think, you know, being cognizant that a gifter may, have taxes if they're giving to you is good. Um, but I think oftentimes we harp too much on investors um, saying that, well, did you pay the taxes for this? Did you pay taxes for that? When it may not be relevant to your EB-5 investment. Right. Um, Nima, question for you. Me if again. Someone, <laughs> if someone's done partial funding, does it matter what are the dates of investment or all that matters is that the funding is complete before the application is adjudicated? Uh, I think two things to be aware of. So funding of the investment, it's before the application is adjudicated, right? That would be the USCIS rule. Uh, the two things to be aware of with the project is the project is going to give you a timeline. Uh, if you exceed that timeline, there may be a penalty. Uh, they may not be willing to negotiate, um, you know, an extension of that timeline. Um, and if there is no extension of that timeline, uh, you know, maybe USCIS will review it and say, even though you have all the money now, 
maybe you violated the contract. So so that's something to to be cautious of. The second thing to be cautious of is if you have an investment period with the project that you're investing in, five years, six years, seven years, uh, that period may not begin until maybe you're fully invested. Um, I wouldn't imagine that there are many projects out there that would start the clock when you put in a hundred thousand uh, rather than when you put in the eight hundred thousand. Thank you.